Uh, uh, thanks for the warm welcome. Um, so before we get started, I got to tell you, I'm getting over a sinus infection. Um, so I, I'm, my, my ears stopped up. So if I feel a little, if I sound a little wacky or something like that, just know I'm, I'm getting over something. Hey, Janie, how, how long do I have? Because I can become long-winded. <laughs> so, so just let me, um, what, what, what's my time? What, what? We, a, we had an hour, so 11.45, 45 more minutes. Okay, 45 Is that minutes. Good? Okay. okay, thank you. Oh, it's good to be here. It's an honor to be here. Um, you know, I, you know, when Janie was introducing me, um, it sort of feels so small because like I'm, I'm at a peer conference and I was thinking about, you know, when I got claimed in 1991 and, and how humbling that was and I came in with nothing. Um, and then I was thinking about like what peer services represent. And so to all of you who's doing the peer work, who was working with people just like me when I first got claimed, I want to tell you, y'all should give yourself before I even get started, just a, a, a warm welcome to yourself for being here, because it's really, really, truly important work. Without people before me, I wouldn't be sitting in places that I sit today. So uh, just know and understand that the, the work of peer work was, was um, uh, way, way before it was a profession. It was because of people um, who helped me that got me to where I'm at today. So take your hats off. Um, the work is important. Um, you know, I was I was sitting there thinking about where should I go with this, and then, you know, I was thinking about the role of peer work, and what I wanted to do today is really talk about my experience with peer work, and sort of my both my uh, personal personal experience as well as my professional experience, and then sort of at some point as I look at the clock, I'm going to probably leave sometimes for any questions you may have for me. Um, because I know when I when I was up here and all this other stuff, uh, I, I didn't like people talking to me because I, I used to love to ask questions and I like to talk too. So um I, and I can go I can go on and on and I don't want to do that. Um but 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 the evolution of peer is a really interesting um concept. Um you know I, I, I want to read something because like the way I got clean was through a 12-step program. And so they knew about peer work way before we talk about it like today, like we talk about it as a profession, but I wanted to read something and really speak to this sort of what peer, what peer services is for me and, and sort of like what the thing, nothing about us without us and, 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 and sort of try to put it into some type of work that's gonna make sense. And 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 the and the twelve step program of Narcotics Anonymous, they have this they have this reading and this in how it worked, right? And 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 there's I'm I'm gonna read it. Um, and and it says we feel that our approach to it to the disease of addiction is completely realistic. For the therapeutic value of one addict helping another, it is without parallel. We feel that our way is practical. For one addict can best understand and help another addict. And so I just wanted to take that. And so I remember when, when I got clean, um, I, I remember going to treatment and, and I remember like sitting in treatment and I was sort of in a fog, but I couldn't remember anything they said in treatment. Like I, I used to go to groups and, and I didn't really feel connected to the group, but I did feel safe, right? I felt like I was in a safe place. But my 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 counselor wasn't a recovering person. It, it, it was she was like a therapist who just came in and talked to me and stuff like that. But I remember when I would leave leave treatment, we would go to twelve step meetings, and then I would talk to people who had been through my experience. I felt so spiritually connected, right? And 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 I think when we talk about peer services. My, my early days was around people who was who who had lived the experiences that I had right like I wouldn't be here today without them like you know I remember you know when when I first got clean you know um there was there was things like I didn't truly understand like I didn't really know how to live like I'll be really completely honest with you I was a mess like I like I hated everybody I hated everything 
but I, I wanted to be clean, but I wasn't even sure if I wanted to be clean. I was just like a mess. I didn't know how to deal with money. I didn't know how to deal with relationships. I was just, I didn't know how to work. I didn't, I didn't know anything. I, I, and so I remember like there was these guys, right, that I used to look at and I dreamed of being like that, right? And I remember they used to come and pick me up even when I wouldn't, didn't want to go. It was like, yo, we come to pick you up for a meeting. I, was, I just wanted to stay home and look at TV. It was like, we come pick you up for a meeting. And I was like, oh my God, I wish they get off my back, right? Like they, they, they just, they just like came for me, right? And then we would get in the car and then they would start talking to me. And then they would tell me what I was feeling, but even though they would tell me that I would deny it, right? But, but they would tell my story, right? Like about how I was feeling, what I was going through and what I needed to do, right? Without even me asking for it. And for some reason, what I felt like was like they knew who I was, right? And there was this sort of, there was this sort of thing that I couldn't get from treatment. It was, it was this, this connection that I couldn't explain at the time, right? And I remember they, they taught me, like, I remember the early things they used to teach me was like how to do things without using drugs, right? Like we would go bowling. I never, like bowling wasn't even a thing I even did, right? And I remember going bowling and then I, I remember the, the thing I did when I went bowling, my first experience was I went to try to do the bowling ball and instead of going forward, it went backwards and like to hit some of them, right? Like, but they laughed about it, right? Like, and, and I was like, what is the laughter for? And I didn't like people laughing. I didn't like anything. But they said, you know, I remember one of the things they said though, they said, we're gonna, we're gonna love you until you learn how to love yourself. And for whatever reason, I used to like go and think about that. And I remember they used to tell me to put affirmations, you know, like, hey, you know, love yourself and you are somebody special. And, and they used to tell me this. And I remember like this, this, you know, what we had then was like sponsors and they say, you know, they used to, my sponsor came over and put this thing up on my mirror and said, you are somebody special. So every morning I would go and they would, and I would read this thing and it was so dumb and stupid, but I had to look at it every morning and stuff like that. And, and he would come over every week to make sure it was still up because I would take it down and, and eventually I would just keep on reading. But I remember when I got to one year, and, 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 and when I got one year clean, and I remember thinking the only people I could think was people with the lived experience. I like, I never really thought about treatment. I never thought about anything else. It was people who was on the road with me. Uh, and it was people who offered me the emotional support that took me through those times that I didn't want to get out of the times I was struggling and the times I could just call someone, right? And, and so, I look at sort of how the evolution of sort of like what we talk about peer services today, right? Like we're talking about that therapeutic value of sort of a person who has lived this experience and know how to talk to someone with that lived experience. And 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 and, and what, when I when I when I think of that and the theme, it's like they can't really do anything without us, right? You know, I I. You know, I, I listened to all the things that, you know, um, Janie was talking about I've done, but each one of those things, each one of those things I've done, every one of them know that I'm someone who has the lived experience. I have never shot away in any job that I've ever had about my lived experience. Um, and actually one of, the, one of the reasons I have done that was because I wanted them to know that there was someone with the lived experience is gonna sit in the room and it's gonna challenge them with some dumb idea they may have about people who, you know, that they didn't know anything about, who sometimes was often afraid. You know, one of one of my first jobs was that there was no, there was no one in recovery but me in the room. And they was always trying to make policy decisions. And I remember they used to, it was so you know, back then I wasn't that sane either because I was I was really confrontational back when I first got clean. But they used to they used to say the dumbest stuff like about 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 addicts, but as though like they they saw them with the stigma that was associated with them as that they, they never recovered, right? Like they always saw them as like, oh yeah, you better watch them. They're gonna steal stuff. 
all we, you know, all they they saw this punitive action and and this confrontation model that they wanted to do. So, so I'm going back way back to 1992. The way people used to treat people in recovery back then was they had this confrontational approach to sort of like how you get stuff. And some of y'all probably heard these terms about, you know. And this, this was not just in the 12 step programs, but this was actually in treatment too. Work the steps of dumb motherfuckers and stuff like that. It was like very confrontational. Like I'm talking about like in your face, like you either get it or you don't get it. But but the people, but the people who was actually the, the people who were being successful, it worked for some people, right? Like that, that approach worked for some people. But what what I what I also saw was a certain level of compassion too. Like what, what people were saying that there was people who was coming to pick people up and showing them compassion and showing them love and the support that no one was really talking about, right? There was this underlying, there was these other things that was going on, but the ones that was getting the most, the, the most um, uh, coverage was those, those confrontational kind of things. And um, I, I, I took that approach at first, this confrontational one, but it didn't feel good. And, and, and the reason why I didn't feel good because that's not what happened. It didn't. No one did that to me when I got clean. And so I remember in 1993, I I I was like that was that I changed my approach. That it was so it, I I no longer was going to be that confrontational person. And that the other thing that that I learned at that time was there was going to be many pathways for many individuals. Like. And that I was gonna to have to learn how to find a way to use my story to help somebody and to use somebody else's story to help somebody too, right? Because my story, my story has a certain uniqueness to it that may not apply to everyone. You know, there were some people, I, I remember like, you know, there's some people, if I take my story, I never used methamphetamines, right? So if I use methamphetamines use as my story. Then that probably won't help someone. But but what I can tell you though, if I tell you what it felt like and what my suffering was and all the underlying issues about who I was as a person, it didn't matter what drug I used, right? And so what I started like focusing on is like what was what was the key component, right, around addiction? And it wasn't about the drug use because what they had taught me was drug use was only a symptom. Right, like that was the way to mask things, right? And I had to go a little deeper, right? I had to get to sort of the source of what was causing me to sort of keep living or keep using something outside of myself to make me feel good. And so that took me to sort of like wanting to understand addiction at a deeper level and sort of kind of figure this thing out. And not only through like the 12 step, because the 12 step program was really my support system. It was, it was the thing that was sort of gonna keep me afloat, but it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily going to do some of these other things that I needed as well. And I remember I, I moved, I moved to Portland in 1995 and that sort of became my sort of intellectual journey, um, about learning what addiction was about. I had went to college before and I finished, um, here in, in Port, at Portland State, of uh, really trying to understand addiction from this sort of scientific approach, right? Not saying that was going to be my path, but I needed to understand what was the sort of core things about addiction that we all sort of have in common, um, some common things around it, right? And one of the things that, you know, when I speak to people today, I really speak about those things because I don't really get into sort of, you know, telling stories about my drug use because those are the things that would sort of keep me disconnected from you. But one of there's some emotional connections that I can talk to most people that's in recovery and they connect with. And I found like through 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 peer peer mentoring, that's what it's about. Like my story usually get me, my story of drug use usually get me in the door. And people are like, oh yeah, that dude, he knows, he he's a user. But it's not the thing that's gonna keep me connected, right? Like, because at some point, like somebody's gonna like go, okay, well, he knows how to use drugs, but does he know how to recover? Right? Does he know the next steps? Right? And and I think, you know, when I look at peer services today, you know, like um, when I when I first introduced in, to peer services, probably was in the 
in the early 90s through Central City Concern when they started the peer mentoring program um, with people coming out of the institution. I was working um, in, in, the, in the correctional institution and um, Randy and some other people, we, we I start referring people to that program in jail and some other people who was working in, in, in the peer mentoring program. And they sort of had this sort of approach about like, we're gonna help these people. And they wanted the worst case scenarios, like people who have seriously like have failed all treatments and sort of this other approach. And we're gonna, we're gonna show them love sort of this recovery style. And it was highly effective, right? And then I went on to Washington County to work with some peers out of Quest and also um, Bridges to Change. And we started taking an approach. And, 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 you know, when they talk about, you know, when they said nothing about us without us, listen to this. this and what was so fascinating about the one when I was working at Washington County was there was no peer services in Washington County. And then Bridges had changed and some other people came in and there was all these people. I was working inside of a correctional um, program and people was going back to jail. They was failing. They was going back to prison and all this other stuff. And you know what? And somebody said, well, if you bring some peers in, we can help people get jobs. We can help people stay clean. We can do all this other stuff. And then they won't be doing all that. And we'll save you some money. And guess what they did? They bought peers in. Guess what, what do you think happened? People got jobs. People, they go back to prison. And every citizen um, declined. So, so, so it, what, was, what was so fascinating was, um, this is in, in Oregon. I know some people may not be from Oregon, but Washington County is really a, a tough county to sort of get these services. And they had these really, they had these really stringent rules about, you know, the, the whole negotiation with them was about like, what are you talking about? We're gonna bring criminals back in to help criminals? Like, what are you talking about? There's a friend of mine who worked, and I don't know if he's here, but there's a friend of mine uh, that, that I played golf with and he he's a mentor there, but he was one of the roughest criminals in Washington County. He's he's a peer mentor there and, and they saw the change in him, right? Like after he had went through all these institutions. So what, one of the things about, you know, what they what they started to understand is, is that, you know, I think Jimmy was um, a prime example of like, if you do certain things, that people can recover. And, and, you know, and sometimes we need, we need like the hardest core person to get clean, right? Because they, they can show, you know, non recovering people that it's possible, right? They can actually be the spokesperson. And I think that that's what he became. And then there's peer services all over Washington County now, right? Because of that, right? And so, um, you know, and so I, I am a firm believer and I have been, I'm just looking at the time. Um, I am a firm believer in peer services and I'm gonna move to my next next part was my, my, my next sort of part of where peer services played a vital role in, in changing um, sort of how we see peer services is when I was the, um, when I was on the uh, Governor's Alcohol and Drug Policy Commission. Listen, they, they showed up and showed out is how we used to say it in the black community, right? They showed up and showed out. And when I'm saying they showed out, they came, they came strong, they came with what they wanted, they demanded certain changes and, and you know what? And they, and they came in numbers. So one of the things about the peer movement is that what they show was if you show up in numbers and you show up with a message, change will happen because it, it, because the strategic plan was really, if you if you look and, and see some of the people that was what was in the peer movement, they they really wrote to some degree the Oregon strategic plan around treatment services, especially the, re, the recovery services component of that strategic plan, and so and and how recovery is delivered, right? And if you look at Measure One Ten and sort of the policy changes around that, right, and those things, so. What, what I'm saying is, is that the, the voice of peers is finally showing a, a that they, they are showing that they are part of the conversation where they once were. You know, treatment is sort of, there, there's a role for treatment as well, right? Like, because it, we should have a continuum of service, right? But once upon a time, treatment was the only way. It was 
like, oh, you go to treatment and then everything else follow. Well, we know today people don't necessarily have to go to treatment. They could actually get peer services and that's good enough, right? You know, I used to always wonder and I used to tell people, why do we want to keep sending people to treatment when they went to 20 treatment um, programs and they can probably teach it themselves, right? They, they need recovery skills, right? Why, why do we have to send them there, right? Maybe they just need peer support services, right? Where you can teach them all the things that they have learned. Maybe, maybe that's all they need. Maybe they need emotional support and all this other stuff. Why are we, we like sort of spending this enormous amount of money sending people back and forth to treatment when we haven't tried these other things? And so um, one of the things, you know, what I've been promoting is that I don't think everyone need to go to treatment. I, I actually think that sometimes if, you know, someone had been to treatment like, like I had, I went in and out of treatment. Actually, my last treatment that I went to, I could probably, I, I probably could have taught some of the classes because I went to them so many times and I actually was just taking up space. The only thing I was waiting for, only thing I really, and, and I'm just being honest with you and I've been a practitioner in treatment and I support treatment as well. But I was taking up actually space. I, you know, the only thing that treatment did for me the last time I went to treatment, it gave me a place to rest, a place to sleep. It gave me food. And, 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 and what I really wanted was that ongoing support that I got where the guys used to show up for me and like take me out on passes and stuff like that. And, and really how to live without the use of drugs because I had already knew all the educational pieces, what it does to your brain, all the other stuff they taught me. And I, I just needed, I, I needed that. I needed that things that I didn't do that I before was that sort of engagement with the recovery community and having that, that, that emotional and social support that I didn't get in previous times. And I wish at that time there was a program, like a peer program I could have went to and just hung out, played basketball, and then really just like, you know, went to meetings and had that person that like I uh, was struggling or whatever to get me back on track. Um, but that wasn't available to me at the time, it was only treatment. So I am so happy now that there are peer run organizations that people can just show up and go to and they don't have to go through, you know, that spending of money or, or, or time when they can just get what they really need and it's on demand. Um, and, and I think measure 110, is is attempt to sort of do that. I can get recovery on demand, not well, I got to wait for it. I can just like if I need it, I just show up. Um and that that is a real big thing. Um you know I guess you know um I was gonna stop about 1040 to sort of um 1035 uh, for questions. And and I think the other piece that you know um that that I think you know when I look at peer services is that what, what I guess what I see future wise, you know, I'm in Santa Cruz County and um, <laughs> what's really interesting, I got to tell you, Oregon, y'all are doing some really good work in field services. We got to do some work out here. So I'll probably be calling on some of you from Oregon to come and do some work here. Just saying, um, hopefully nobody's from Santa Cruz County on this. Um, if so, um, it's okay. Um, but what, one of the things that's really interesting about like peer services here is not, um, how can I say, it's not as robust as it is in Oregon. And so one of the things that um, I've been talking to my boss is that I'm gonna create a robust, um, I'm gonna create a peer, a robust peer services here. Let's just say that. And so um, I talked with him last Monday about that. And so we, we, we're gonna have more peer services here in the county. Um, I looked at the funds and, there's, there's ways that I, I can improve that. And, and, and what was what, what, what the other interesting thing was there's this one program that, that's in Santa Cruz County who does peer work. And I was talking to some of the, the clients and stuff like that. And there's a need for it. Like there's a lot of clients who are saying, I just need somebody to like do this. I just need, they, you know, some people, you know, are saying, I just need a sponsor. I don't want to go to treatment. I just want somebody well, I can go to, I can hang out, I can do some stuff. I don't, I don't really need treatment. And, and I'm saying that's not a, a, a there's not a lot of places that they can go like that. And so 
my goal in the next year is to really create maybe one or two systems of care for people just to receive peer services um, in my capacity here. Um, and then and then the other thing, oh, I see my friend Nicole is here. What's up, Nicole? I, I just she just popped up on my screen, so forgive me. It's my friend Nicole. But uh, um, you know, I'm just I, I guess as as I wind down to things, you know. There's nothing, you know, I don't, there's nothing that none of us can do without peer services. Like, you know, I, I just, I, I just, I just want to say this, like, you know, I'm a very humble person. When Jamie was reading out all those things that I've done, it seems like weird to me, right? Like those are like things, but in the, the, the core of who I am, I'm a recovering person. Like I, I never get away from that. Like, it's so funny because like, uh, like I'm the chief of substance use disorder service in Santa Cruz County, but like deep down, I'm a recovering person, right? Like, and my lens by the, the way I see the world is through that, right? Like, and, and it's a strange thing because a title, like even when I get a title, I still don't see myself no more than a recovering person, right? And like, and then I'm always trying to figure out what is the best way to help recovering people, right? And, and what I'm saying that is really to really help myself and, and seeing some of the struggles of like what our system sort of creates, right? Like, you know, one of the things, you know, working with Multnomah County and other systems is that there's always these policies that people make. And the policy makers are generally not recovering people, right? And they're not, they're not doing it intentionally to sort of like hurt recovering people, they just don't know. Like they they don't they don't sort of understand, you know, the sort of understanding of what we what recovering people need. And so they think they're doing like a great deed. They think that oh we can do this. And you know what? It is sort of like it, it reminded me like when I was like using and like you know I, I'll be sitting around plotting something and then everything sounds like a great idea until I started doing it. And then it's like, oh yeah, that wasn't a good idea, right? Like, you know, um, and so, so it's, it's sort of one of those, it's one of those things. Everything sounds like a great idea to them. And then the implementation is sort of like, oops, that, I, I don't know if this, this worked or not, right? And so I sometimes show up and say, well, have you considered this, right? Have you considered going talking to some of those people, right? Have you have you considered that that may not be a great approach? Um, like, have you considered that sometimes maybe that's not what they need? You know, sometimes maybe you might want to take a relationship instead of a transactional approach. Maybe you want to go talk to those people because I know, like for me, recovering people and been working in this field for a long time. It's better to develop relationships with the recovery community than one that, that you in some kind of transaction. Like, here, we want you to do this, and that's it. Like, you want to develop relationships with people like us. Like, we're, we, we, we're relational. I'm using this in a broad sense of the word. We're relational people, and, and, and we, like to, we like to be heard, right? And we like our voices to be heard. And like, long as our voices are being heard and recognized, I don't think we always want people to do what we want them to do, but we least want to be heard. And, and I think the thing what you're talking about is like, it's being heard. Like, like we, are, we are no longer that stigma when you don't get to listen to us anymore. We, you know, like we're becoming strong. We're becoming lawyers and doctors and everything else. And so our voice really has not that of the gutter addict that you once thought that we were gonna stay or be. We're, we're greater than that. We're smart people, we have grown and our message is not gonna be heard by what you, the stigma that you put on us. And I think our message should always be in that light, right? We are not what you think we are and we're not, and, and we can't be denied of those things. And no matter what you think of us, we, we're gonna show up and we're gonna show you otherwise. And I think that that's the message that, you know, this, this, the thing that you have should be that message, like no matter what you, and sometimes I know if, it, if you're like me, it feels sort of like, oh my God, uh, you know, like this a risk, right? Like I'm, I'm doing a risk, what are they gonna say about it? You know, risk taking is good for us. Like we just gotta go, we just gotta go with it, right? Like don't even think, don't even second think, you, second guess yourself, just do what is right, you know? And, and I've learned that since doing this work for quite some time. 
you know, that risk taking, yes, it's going to bring about all the recovery things that come up for you. That's why you go get your support group and tell them, but don't ever let them know. That. You go with confidence, you go with your voice, and you go with what is right. And then let the call cards fall where they may is what I what I do. And and I, I'll deal with the rest of the stuff later. Um, I want to thank you for inviting me out. Um, hopefully you got something out of this. I kept hearing the voice in my head, so hopefully it didn't sound as worse as it worse as it did in my head. My ears really stopped up. So um, I guess I can open it for any questions that you have for me, or you can just reclaim your time and do whatever you like to do for the rest of the day. But thank you. I heard a lot of clapping of none at all, but that's okay. <laughs> <laughs> there is a lot of clapping, clapping, Anthony. Okay. Thank you so much. And we're just honored that you uh, launched our conference with sharing uh, your experience, strength, and hope. And just appreciate you so much. And Santa Cruz County's gain is our loss, but we know we will stay connected. Um, and I saw a lot of comments in there. You got a lot of volunteers ready to come down and help launch peer services. We I do see Kevin. I see Kevin is talking about coming down. Kevin yeah. Fitz. Um, I yeah. Seen that in a while. Here, let's see. There was a question in the chat. I'm trying to. A lot of people sharing. We're gonna have. Uh, we can save the chat. Um, and Anthony, if you're open to having people reach out to you, um, if we could share your uh, yes. email. Uh, here's the question. Uh, labeling addiction, this is from Rhea. Uh, labeling addiction or mental health challenges a disease removes the stigma of personal moral failing, but it also labels people as sick for the rest of their lives. Can you talk about the language of disease use and substance use and mental health recovery and how it affects both outside perception and perceptions of self? I'm curious about your feelings about the disease paradigm. Yeah, I get this question often. I, um, so, so let me just use the word addiction. Um, when, when I'm talking about addiction, like, you know, and, and substance use disorder, I'm using two different terms, right? When I'm thinking about addiction, I'm thinking about a, a set of behaviors sort of like, it's not necessarily inclusive of only alcohol or any narcotics or anything. It could be food, it could be gambling, probably gambling, it could be any of those things. So, it, you know, so that's that. And then when I talk about substance use disorder, I'm really actually talking about a, just like any other diagnosis that someone get. I don't usually use the word addicts or alcohol, or addicts or alcoholic to describe an individual in my professional world. And one of the things I think, you know, when, when I think about that, the sort of concept of language, right? The, the, the concept of language, even, even if you use substance use disorder or addiction describing like, um, you know, someone with an eating um, disorder, of all those other things, you know, we, we sometimes get sort of caught up into sort of the, the, the language piece of it. And I focus a lot more on the outcomes. Like it, it's, 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 it, it, it's, it's dependent on what, what audience I'm going to, too, right? Like if I was going to an audience of like, you know, providers in the community, I might use different terms. And if I was going to some, some group that to sort of like, you know, just against people with addiction problems or whatever, or, or any other type of problem, I probably wouldn't use terms like that. I wouldn't use disorder. I wouldn't use those things. So, so I always think it, it, depends, it depends on the audience that you are referencing and knowing those audiences when you're going in, what kind of language to use. If you was going into a medical profession, I think you would use different language. So I don't get so caught up into the language as much as the audience that I'm, I'm sort of addressing. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Thank you, Anthony. And we also have some raised hands. I see uh, Alton K. 
Kevin and Charity. So can we go in that order? I'm sorry, I don't know whose hand was first, but I'll go with what I see. <laughs> Thanks. Alton? So Mr. Jordan, can you hear me? Uh, uh, Mr. Jordan, I don't know who that is, but uh, Alton Harvey, how you doing my brother? Um, well, sir, and so I want to first of all say thank you so much. I really appreciate hearing you speak. I've I've heard you several times, and 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 it's always always a privilege and an honor. Secondly, I want to say that I I disagree with your description of humility. I I know nothing about the humbleness in you. <laughs> 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 Uh, you got jokes <laughs> early in the morning, Alton. Yeah, well, you know us. So, yeah. and thirdly, thirdly, uh, the captain of the training division of, of the Portland Police Bureau has reached out to Greg Stone to uh, kind of give a, a mini training on addiction to some new cadets that are coming in. And Greg reached out to me to be a part of that along with Jerome Gilligan. And my question to you is, <clears throat> I mean, and you know me, and so I feel comfortable in asking you this. You know, I'm gonna be my authentic self, but <clears throat> what kind of direction would you give me in bringing a message to these, to these new cadets about addiction? <clears throat> So somewhat, so I'm going to go back to the original question about like language. I would, I, so if I was working with the police, I would, I would not use the term addicts, alcoholics. I would try to paint those individuals as human beings with a medical issue and sort of like frame the conversation around these individuals have medical issues with some behavioral things that many of them are not at harm or a risk to them or any other community member. They need help just like any other individuals and that they may have bizarre behaviors associated with the drugs. They're usually not a danger to anyone else. And that's been proven over and over, right? So I would, I would stick to this sort of like this human component to someone suffering with substance use disorder and stay away and then really talk about the stigma that often is associated with it, that drug addiction and people under the influences of drug of this superhuman, they have superhuman strength and that they're willing to sort of do all this danger to society. I would, I would try to, I would, I would have them to reevaluate that of people with addiction problems. And that, that's been sort of the, the stigmas that's been associated with police officers of saying sort of the worst case with someone is on angel dust and then they go crazy. But the average person using drugs and acting bizarre, not, not that individual. So I would try to like destigmatize sort of substance use disorder, disorder and, and, they, and the influence that they may have or, or the thoughts around people under the influence. Appreciate that. Thank you for that question, Alton. We'll go to Kevin and then Charity. Thank you. Yeah, hello, uh, Dr. Jordan. I think that's how you address you. Uh, thanks so much for your speech. Uh, I'm a huge fan of yours. Um, I wonder whether you could opine upon why has it been so challenging in the Oregon region for the SUD managerial class to understand that we need specific treatments and supports for African-Americans run by, staffed by, uh, and supported by African-Americans. I know two, two friends of mine, two brothers who have been trying to get something off the ground in uh, Oregon for such a long time. Why does that seem to fall uh, on uh, tone deaf to some of our leaders around some of these cultural needs? And uh, I, I, I have great respect for you and glad to hear your keynote. Thank you, great job, by the way, thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Um, I'm, a, I'm a transparent person, and I'm just gonna just be completely honest with you. That's two, in my opinion, that's two reasons. There's the sort of the historical piece that a lot of um, programs of color have sort of not had the greatest success, and then there is this other, I would say, 
there's a systemic racism that exists that in an organ that I think that when you when you're trying to give this this sort of specialized look at uh, programs of color, there's a sort of resistance to that. There's sort of there's a sort of belief that all you know all programs should be treated equally, right? Like that that like if you're going out and you're going to target a, a program of color, like whoa whoa, uh, what about this other program? Like what about these other services, right? And I think they don't say that like openly. I think it's sort of like I, I, you know, and this is just my experience, and and you know, hopefully no one don't go back and say, I think they say Oregon is a racist place. I'm not saying it's a racist place. I'm saying there's this sort of there's sort of this there's there's a sort of things that I don't, I don't think um, Oregon some sometimes address when it comes to race. It's sort of a subtle thing that 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 they they say one thing, but sort of like when when you go to implement things, they put up more barriers. Then they do solutions. And it's sort of like, and I'm just going to share this too. It's sort of like, sort of like some of the reasons why I think a lot of the services in Oregon is uh somebody said Julie B said, I'm saying Oregon this is a racist place. Thanks, Julie. I'll let you say that. But uh, but it's sort of like the treatment services sometimes, like that you'll find some of the treatment services in Oregon where people put up more barriers to deny people into services than to, than to break them down, right? And, they, and, and I think it's something about in Oregon that they, can, they like to pick and choose what they want or who they want to provide services or who they want to give services to. And so, um, um, I, I don't know, I, I, hopefully measure 110 um, from my understanding and connections, it sounds like that may change maybe there's going to be some targeted sort of approaches to um to to services for people of color on the BIPOC community so. charity i think is next yeah hi um thank you for so much for you know sharing your story um you know, there's definitely a lot to learn there. Uh, I was wondering, um, you know, you talked a little bit about like treatment facilities um, and said services and then, you know, about uh, peers. And I guess I was curious, like, is there anything happening now or that we're doing now to try to uh, connect those things? Like, integrating, um, you know, that peer support into that, uh, you know, like uh, mental health model, you know, slash like uh, uh, treatment facilities, that kind of thing. Because I think you make a good point about people coming in and out of services. It's, and it seems like what I'm wondering is, you know, what piece is missing? You know, peer services obviously offers uh, you know, something specific and uh, providing a kind of community and support. These facilities don't necessarily provide that. Is there a way that those two things can be integrated, um, you know, so that individuals that are struggling uh, with addiction, um, you know, have, have the best access and opportunity, um, you know, to, to grow? You know, you... <laughs> So to, to be completely honest with you, I think in Multnomah County, we have made some strides in that, but like the, the issue is like the payment model, right? There's this, there's, a, there's this thing where people are unwilling to be innovative around sort of payment models to support what you're talking about. This is sort of like, I, you know, I, I, remember, I remember trying to talk to the state about like, if someone, let's say someone leaves residential treatment, right? And then, and then let's say a month or two down the road, they 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 sort of relapse. Why, why, why do they have to go back into services? Why can't they get recovery support services, right? And then get it paid for, right? Like, because they just left treatment, they got all, they they stayed in this expensive place, they got all these skills. What, what all they really need is some support to help them practice those skills ongoing, right? So, but then there's this payment model, right? Like then, then how do people pay for that, right? Like 
how do how do that peer organization get paid for those type of services, right? Unless they there's this way where you can contract with the county if they have funds for, and sometimes that's sort of the way they got it set up. That's limited funds for that. So one of the things we need to get the CCOs like somewhere where they plan a flat fee or something to pay for the services of those individuals or some other payment model where when someone is receiving just recovery support services, the agencies are made whole in providing that services for those individuals, right? And, and so we, we, we got to get the state, the CCOs and the counties coming up with a payment model that support what you are talking about. So I think that's the biggest barrier uh, for the most part. Okay, uh, thank you for that. Um, I, I, while you were speaking, I kind of had a, a follow-up thought. Is that okay if I share? Absolutely. Yeah, um, I was wondering, I mean, you know, what if, you know, you're talking about um, how you kind of recovered through a 12-step program and you had these peer supports. Um, I've worked in treatment facilities before. Oftentimes, uh, residents that are there will bond with one another, but they might not necessarily have the same goal or, you know, necessar not necessarily the training as a peer support would. What if, you know, say like in a 12-step program, you know, for every resident that you have, you know, say it's a 20 bed facility, um, you know, you have peers that are assigned to, you know, to each of those residents that have to meet with them at, you know, a certain amount of times a week. I, I guess what I'm just curious about, you know, you're talking about the payment method, but um, trying to imagine the ways that, um, you know, that that could really be implemented, um, you know, and also looking at that history that you're talking about, like they've been in treatment five times, like, why aren't we taking a different approach? Um, if there's a way to uh, kind of record that, um, you know, how many times people are in and out of uh, facilities and, and kind of create different, um, you know, uh, different strategies around that, like, okay, we're not going to put them back in this facility, but there's these, you know, like if you go from inpatient to outpatient, they'll provide outpatient services, like something specific to, um, you know, re recovering people. No, I, I mean, I think those are great ideas. You got to get on some innovation team for that. Like maybe, maybe you should talk at the state. And what I'm saying is, is that there's many different pathways for what you're talking about. And I think what you're offering is sort of how do we innovate multi, a multi-level approach to sort of what you're talking about? I, I'm just giving one example, but I think that there's many sort of examples that we all got together, we could create a pathway that would work for the different modalities of individuals who believe in those type of services. So I, I, think, I think that there needs to be at some state level, some kind of what you're, some kind of group that come together about those type of um, services and how do you integrate peer services and and there's a payment method for that because I don't want to see peer services like like it was before doing work and not getting paid for it either like if, if you're going to say this is important work then we we, we so, so this is my other little pet thing too right I don't want peer services marginalized either right like if, if you're gonna say it's important, we have to pay people so that retention. So we, we don't want to continue to, if, to, to, to not pay people if you're gonna say that the outcomes are great for them, right? So, you know, we don't want to be like, oh, we can get them for cheap. And then and then we turn this model into like a peer model. And then you, then you become a case manager, you become all these other things that they don't wanna pay for because you are cheaper either, right? So you, that peer services should have a defined role about what they do and they should get paid for that. And if then case managers can get paid for where they want to. I think when, when, when me and Eric wrote the peer supervision, we really focus a lot about peer services and what they do and they should not become junior counselors or case managers. So I, 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 I just want to sort of make sure that that is clear too. Um, Janie, um, I don't know if we got one hand raised. Do, do we have time to answer that? Yes, um, it, this is just, you know, 
people have a lunch hour before things uh, move on, I believe at 1245. So we're good as long. Yeah. And it looks okay. like Lillian is next with a question. So thanks for taking the time. There you go, Lillian. I am a brand new uh, hired. Um, hey, Lillian, I, I you. hey, Lillian, you're, you're breaking off. Position. And I am Lillian, can you put Lillian? Sorry, uh, what is the assertive community team? Somebody's need, not on mute, Janie. Yeah, think. I'll fix that. And Lillian, if you could please put your question in the chat. Um, you're frozen on screen and we're cutting out. Sorry about that. Um, what to do to make this better? Is this helpful? And, yeah, Lillian, I'll uh, see. If, Let's see. Uh, hold on, Anthony. No. Okay. Hello. You're unmuted now. Thanks, Anthony. Looks okay. like Paul has a question. Okay. Hi, Anthony. Uh, How you doing, Paul? Loved what you're saying. Um, you know, I my experience was uh, I got sober in '82, and uh, what happened to me? I was ping pong from mental health lockups to treatment center to mental health lockup. And finally, on the fourth trip, they put me in a place and they actually called it dual diagnosis. And, uh, you know, they just asked me, hey, Paul, do you think what's going on in your life might have something to do with your alcohol and drug use? Bang, you know, that's, you know, that started me on the path to self-reflection. Because for me, it doesn't matter how much, how little, or what you do, it's what happens to you. Uh, but the problem is that we don't put substance abuse and mental health kind of in the same money stream or integrate it very well or use the, we, you can't use medical model basically in my mind for substance use disorders. And, you know, I'm, I, I don't have answers, but I know that the money stream is, is the problem. Uh, it systemically wrecks the whole thing because I never met, and I met a lot of addicts and alcoholics who said, I woke up one morning and decided to ruin my life with something. Then how it works. There's something underneath that needs to be addressed along with the, 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 the symptom of, of substance abuse. So, you know, I, I really would like to just put that out there for people to, to think about. And peer support is, is kind of the answer. Because, you know, I love to, to uh, do what I need to do and what's right. And if I have to later say I'm sorry, you know, I, I got to do what I got to do um, without breaking any ethics. But, you know, I don't ask permission. I just do it and say I'm sorry if it, if it breaks somebody's poor little model, you know. That's about it. Thanks. You're great. I loved it. Thanks. Thanks, Paul. Uh, 
it looked like people about ready uh it looked like people are ready to go to lunch so um i see people start smiling look at michelle marcus she's like yeah i hit the right topic then lunch time so i i'm i'm definitely okay with um i'm leaving um i have i don't want to keep people away from that tuna sandwich i was i was in a oh she would love um i was in a meeting where someone was talking about their husband take tuna sandwiches to work every day uh, I was so i don't know what that's about but um you know, I, I told them they can come see us because there's probably a 12 step program out there for them. Um, if you have to sort of take tuna sandwiches to lunch every day. Um, but uh, hey, listen, I really, really, really appreciate you listening to me. I, I'm going to leave my what, what I'm afraid of is that I don't I've been here for like two weeks and I don't know quite know what my my email address. So Janie, where's Janie at? Um, Janie, is there a way for you to send it out to the people that was here? Like yes. once I get it and make sure it's the right one, because they gave, they gave me two email addresses and I don't know which one is I supposed to use that would come to me. We can absolutely share that. We okay, do that. please do. Um, but I will share that as soon as I get off and get on my work computer and then I'll send an email to you and then you can just forward that to anybody that want it. Yes, thank you. And maybe um, just uh, Lillian was able to get her question in the chat. Um, what was it? Yes, it, let's see. It was, uh, there's so many chats. Lots of um, thanks to you, Anthony, for, for sharing. Here's Lillian's question. Oh my gosh, sorry, I keep losing it. Keep. Um, Okay, hold on one second. Here it is. I'm brand new in my position as a peer wellness specialist. I was just hired on to an ACT team. There are a couple of issues. We have capacity to serve 10 more people but aren't getting the referrals. Most of our peers have both mental health challenges and addiction. I personally only have uh, the experience of mental health not SUD, how can I help? How could she help? Huh, it's a good question. Um, and did she say they don't have peer services? She is a peer there on that ACT team. She okay. Is, yep, she is a peer support specialist, peer wellness specialist. Um, I don't quite know what the question, so help me understand the question a little more, Jamie. Yeah, she's a peer with mental health uh, lived experience only and uh, is uh, when she supports people that have both mental health and addiction, um, she wants to know how she can help even though she doesn't have that, um, that addiction experience herself. Oh, just the addiction part. Oh, I thought she was talking about just peer services in general. Oh. Uh, well, you know what? See, see, this is the problem, and, and that's what I'm gonna do here, right? Why can't why can't mental health peers partner with um, SUD peers, right? Like, what 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 why can't they connect, right? What uh, is that, Michelle? Are you agreeing with me? Do the hard thing, okay? That's not Michelle. I can see her. She's going this way. Yeah, but but that's what I'm saying. Like our our clients are not unique that most often they have both both they need both services right it's not like one or the other right and so we need to really partner with sud providers and mental health providers and then you still have partnerships right and i think that this is what we get this is what really seriously i'm just saying this that irritates me is what we get caught up into sort of uh i'm, I'm sad and like the mental health I, like I, yeah no, 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 no. Like we all need to learn from each other, right? Like we don't, we we don't have to be like just stuck in this world, like knowing one knowledge, right? You know what? We should all become teachable, right? And that's what I did in like the work that I've done. We should all become teachable. You should want to learn about your clients. If your clients have mental health disorders, you should be learning about that, right? As a, even if you're a sub peer, if you're a mental health peer, 
and your client has sub disorder, you should be learning about all the things you can possibly learn. Not maybe for that individual, but for the next 50 that you're gonna serve, right? You should be you should be soaking up as much knowledge about your clients as much as possible because we you you're serving clients and clients is not just one diagnosis. They are multitude of things. Like they can have many things, right? They can have not only mental health, they can have gambling problems. They can have, they can have marital problems. I mean, you become the jack of everything, right? So the more you learn, the more likely you are, you're going to be successful in your job. So seek knowledge. I, I'm just telling you, if you're new in this field, don't get caught up in your title of like, I'm a substance use peer. I'm a mental health peer. Get caught up into how you best serve your clients. And what and what and what they are suffering with, right? And learning knowledge about, you know, if they if some some people are gonna be in domestic violence situations, learn about what learn about that continuum. Learn everything you can on how to serve clients. And if you learn how to do that, you're gonna be successful. You'll be around for a long time. That's that would be my answer to that. Thank you, Anthony, so much for taking the time to have these conversations and sharing your thoughts and your wisdom. Hey, I did put a Santa Cruz email address in the chat. I think that's one of them. And I okay. think that one comes to me. Um, and it's, it's anthony.jordan at santacruzcounty.us. Okay, we'll still send that out. Yes. And I'll, I'll, I'll send you also, Janie, um, that the, the to, to verify that is correct as well as the other one too, so. Okay, well, best of everything in all your new adventures. And like I said, I hope, you know, I plan on, not I hope, but I plan on, and hopefully all of us here too, on um, staying connected with you and uh, learning and growing uh, more into the future. Absolutely. Hopefully next year, if I ever get invited again, I won't I'll be coming off a, a um, sinus infection. Um, <laughs> maybe, maybe I'll be a little bit more sort of succinct, but anyway. Um, you did you I, did amazing, and I really appreciate it. And I know from all the things in the chat, which we will share with you, we've saved the chat. Um, you'll see all the love that everybody uh, and gratitude everybody offered to you. Um, and, it's and also just, great. Yeah, just keep up the keep up the work. Um, and our people need it. So just keep doing what you're doing. Thanks. Give and go get some day. lunch, Michelle. <laughs> <laughs> I do have some quick announcements for the evening events from 5 to 7 p.m. tonight, Pacific time. We have Death Tolls and Blind Spots and OCSC, that's the Oregon Consumer Survivor Coalition, interactive discussion on ethics and the peer role. And we also, from five to seven, have Art Mindset with Casey Marsh. And if you are interested in exploring your creative side, it's an incredible way of um, not only creating something uh, artistic that um, sort of surprised me that I could do, <laughs> and, uh, and it's something you can also do with your peers. Uh, so there's that as well. Um, so those things are going on tonight. And again, just a big round of applause for uh, Anthony. If you want to unmute and share your, your gratitude. You. All right. Enjoy the conference, everyone. See you later. Thank All right. You. Thank you. You're welcome. Yo, Ann, I'm gonna give you a call, man. Okay. Hey, that was my email address too. So I did get it right. Excellent. Excellent. All right. All right. I this part where I just like end the meeting because it feels so final. Um, but yeah, we'll see you in the workshops and uh, see you soon, Anthony. All right. Nice seeing you, Nicole. Oh, I see. How do we get our CEUs? <laughs> Say hi, Nicole. Hello. <laughs> um, so there will be a, oh, oh I'm glitchy. Um, there will be a uh, download on the website where you can download the CEU tracking sheet. You can fill that out, send us a picture to the email address that is posted all over the 
oh, I disappeared all over the website, um, purepocalypse at mhaoforgan.org, and we will get you your CEUs um, a few weeks after the conference. And Nicole, that's for all the workshops, right? All the workshops, yes. G good job, thank you. And keynotes. All right, bye everybody.